Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Welcome uh, to the B-REC seminar. Uh, today we have an honor from Professor Mark Thompson. Uh, he's a director of the Southeast Asia Research Center and a professor in the Department of Public and International Affairs at the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, and also he was also a part President of the Hong Kong Political Science Association and the Asian Political and International Studies Association. Uh, Professor Mark Thompson uh, is a long friend of mine and he published a lot. Uh, he's a prolific uh, writer, uh, edited a lot of uh, volumes, and he's expert on Southeast Asia politics, especially. Uh, the Philippine uh, politics. But uh, in the past several years, uh, Professor Mark Thompson also uh, took keen interest in Thai politics and published uh, several articles uh, on Thailand and Thailand in comparison with other countries uh, in Southeast Asia too. So it's uh, a very good chance uh, to have him uh, today with us and uh, the title of his talk today is Calling Out Autocratization, the Philippines and Thailand Compare. Uh, I'm very glad that he do this kind of topic because I myself is a comparative guy. I love, uh, you know, comparative cases. So I believe we I'm going to learn a lot from uh, today's talk, uh, so the floor is yours. Mm. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Jock, and uh, thanks to those who are viewing this. Um, I realize there's a strong alternative, uh, or high alternative cost there. I'm competing with a uh, celebrity politician speaker at the moment, so all of those you are viewing, thanks for choosing this uh, option. Um, as uh, Prajak uh, hinted, I've, um, I've been here uh, several times in the past, uh, just going through my mind the number of occasions I've been here, and so it's a pleasure to be back, but it's also, uh, I'm pleased to see that I seem not to have worn out my welcome uh, after all these uh, times coming back, at least uh, now because of the pandemic kept me away uh, for three years, so it's, it's great to be back. I'd also like to mention that the research uh, that this talk is based on uh, is funded in part by a grant from the RGC, Hong Kong Government uh, Research uh, Grant, in which uh, Prajak is the uh, co i and I thank Prajak for his collaboration on this project, which we will be continuing in a similar event in Hong Kong uh, uh, this fall with uh, Prajak as the speaker. So thanks again uh, for this invitation, and I uh, look forward to continuing our collaboration, which of course wasn't easy during COVID, but now we can finally uh, meet up. So uh, as uh, Prajak mentioned, I am fond of doing comparisons, and the Philippine-Thailand comparison is one I've uh, often dwelled on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why I think this is an interesting comparison, despite the obvious differences. Uh, but let me uh, talk first about um, uh, talk first about the um, uh, issue of. Um, autocratization. So uh, autocratization is something that uh, has uh, cropped up in the literature uh, more and more recently um, and can be understood uh, the, the number of different aspects, but one way to understand it is the debilitation or elimination of political institutions and civil society spaces which sustain democracy. It's also been termed backsliding, so you'll see a lot of uh, of the literature uh, talking about it in terms of democratic backsliding, which can be uh, undertaken both by civilians and by uh, military uh, uh, leaders. Uh, it involves the arbitrary exercise of power, often human rights violations, or inevitably perhaps one could say, uh, and, and or uh, the manipulation of elections. And according to some uh, global surveys, uh, the world has become more uh, authoritarian due to this phenomenon of autocratization, in, in, increasingly anti 
uh, democratic behavior of regimes that were originally uh, more democratic in character, and about a fourth of the world's population lives under such recently autocratized regimes. And many key countries are affected, uh, Brazil, Bolsonaro, India, Modi, uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin, a very obvious example, and the USA under Trump won. Let's see if there's a Trump two. Uh, but for now, it's just the first uh, Trump administration. The, the next issue I want to address in a general sense is that of whether autocratization can be disguised. And the background of this uh, consideration is that um, you know, we, we got this discussion about uh, the end of history, Fukuyama's uh, famous argument of 1989, and a lot of criticism of that saying, well, obviously, um, democracy is not the only game in town, and so on. But I think one interesting phenomenon is that autocratizing regimes still usually, there are very few exceptions, I think, claim to be democratic in some sense. So in other words, they're trying to disguise the fact that they're autocratizing. And this is quite a uh, useful strategy uh, if you consider the fact that surveys, uh, a number of, uh, of these global surveys have shown that citizens' views of democracy are actually quite ambiguous. And they're often mixed with or even the inverse of what liberal pluralist interpretations of democracy would suggest uh, we're talking about. Thus, support for democracy can in fact disguise autocratization. And uh, we're going to be talking, I'll be discussing briefly the idea of autocratization via what's been called executive aggrandizement by a president or a prime minister, which is a, uh, where democracy is eroded gradually, but in, in, in a, a legalistic manner with uh, ostensible uh, institutional continuity, and the contrasting uh, way in which autocratization has uh, taken place, which is via military coup or by a civilian so-called Auto Golpe, to use the Latin American term, the self coup uh, of civilian leaders, which quickly but supposedly temporarily uh, dismantles uh, democracy. So, then to speak more specifically, so what kinds of disguises uh, do we find uh, autocratizers using? And obviously, there's a broad range of considerations here, but I've tried to boil it down to two basic forms of disguise. And the first, uh, and this draws on the work of Bromeo, uh, the article I, I cite earlier here, 2016, on backsliding, is the promissory disguise of coups, or, and I would add, uh, the civilian uh, self-coups, the honorable pay, to use the uh, Latin American Spanish term. So this is uh, the promise, promissory aspect is, this occurs, democracy is quickly, abruptly dismantled, but the idea is, well, this is temporary. Uh, and uh, we, democracy will res be restored. Um, and this proves particularly effective when you find a flanking social movement supporting anti-democratic movement supporting this autocratizing effort, advocate, advocating extra, in other words, unconstitutional or beyond the constitution uh, change. Another aspect I think it's important to stress is these kind of regimes, in a sense, are saying, look at our performance. We are going to perform better than what was previously there. That justifies this abrupt break. Uh, we will guarantee stability in a crisis situation. We will bring about good governance when corruption has been uh, common uh, among this so-called democratic government, which we are removing. And another uh, thing you see associated with this kind of promissory uh, autocratization is redefining democracy itself against so-called Western individualist definitions to bring about what's considered more culturally appropriate. And this is particularly evident, I think, in the Thai case, but interestingly, you also find uh, some evidence for this in the Philippine case, which I'll talk about. Uh, so what's culturally appropriate is more uh, communitarian uh, views of, of, of the way society should be governed with, with strict social hierarchies uh, in force. Okay, so that's the one disguise. The second it could be called uh, plebiscitary. And this is a use uh, by these executive aggrandizers, these presidents or prime ministers. So this is strong man rule uh, in the classic understanding of that. This is not political pluralism. These are not people who are trying to uh, strictly obey uh, democratic limits, follow uh, checks and balances. These are strong men, uh, actually sometimes women, if we look at the case of Bangladesh, for example, but generally called strong man rule, rightly because it's generally uh, men involved. 
Um, and this is particularly effective when these uh, plebiscitary leaders win elections, win them handily, in fact, and uh, are shown to have high opinion poll uh, ratings. And this, while they're denouncing the human rights advocacy of, uh, of pesky civil society groups and, of course, uh, foreign groups like Amnesty International, and invoking the popular acclamation of these leaders, saying, who do you believe? You know, these human rights advocates or, or, or somebody who's elected by the people and look at the opinion polls uh, showing how popular I am. Okay, so then to get to the topic of the talk, how then can autocratization be called out? Generally, what we're talking about is the ability of opposition to channel general discontent, general unease at the way this autocratizing regime is governing. But specifically, when there's a triggering event, which I'll talk about in the specific examples of Thailand and the Philippines, when there's a triggering event that causes immense emotional outrage, how can that be channeled by uh, opposition parties that have to be resilient enough to survive the auto autocratic crackdowns, surviving repression, remaining electorally competitive on the one hand, and crucially, very important in the Thai case, uh, the sense of new social movements that arise to fill a kind of civil societal vacuum, uh, despite repression and protests, uh, and can protest against, for example, manipulated elections, arrests and killings of oppositionists, etc. Also important is the fact that there's an active critical media, however small, all, often uh, a very small group or, or, or a very uh, small number of organizations that are really critical in the media, but they're uh, it's very useful to have at least uh, one of them active, and today, of course, social media, right? increasingly important for pushback. So what exactly is being called out? Well, a variety of things, broken promises to begin with. How can the regime claim to have restored stability when there's that fact growing instability? How can the regime claim to be governing well when there's uh, signs of corruption uh, and other forms of poor governance, etc.? That's one thing they can call out. Another is institutional manipulation. Uh, if a referendum is held, what, what if that referendum is really not competitive? What if people really can't uh, campaign for or against it, uh, particularly against it, obviously? Uh, what if there's bias in, the, uh, uh, new, uh, in this new, uh, new constitution which is enacted? Uh, what if elections are stolen, not just manipulated, but actually stolen? Uh, what if politics are judicialized, as many uh, scholars have been talking about in autocratic regimes? And what if so-called independent institutions are, in fact, heavily biased towards the regime? Two other aspects I would stress here, and there, there are others we, we could discuss later, but this is just trying to cover some of the most important ones here, would be to call out human rights violations. Uh, that's a very obvious point, but uh, uh, a crucial one, obviously. Uh, and then going back to this idea of culturally appropriate democracy, not Western-style democracy, uh, one thing you find oppositionists doing is not saying, well, we support Western democracy. Of course, uh, that seems like a very weak argument. Rather, they will make democratic arguments within a religious tradition, which is prevalent within uh, a particular country, and or uh, within sort of class-based cultural terms. And if that sounds a little bit vague, I'll, I'll try to give some examples uh, in a few minutes about that. So it's to, to come up with a kind of counter discourse, not defending this Western imposed democracy, that's obviously a discourse you don't want to be engaged in, but saying, look, democracy is actually part of our culture, including uh, our religious traditions. So the puzzle or the, the question I'm asking in this particular uh, talk is uh, the tale of two oppositions that can be called. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have the Philippine case, where there has been very muted uh, pushback against autocratization under this fellow, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, who was president until uh, the middle of last year. Um, and he was successful with high opinion poll ratings. Um, he uh, defeated opposition candidates, particularly at the Senate level, very important in the Philippines because it's nationally elected, in 2019. And Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the son of a dictator, was easily elected in 2022. I'll talk about that more 
civil society mobilization was there initially, but it waned quickly. The media was strongly weakened, uh, and DDS, which stands for uh, Die Hard Duterte Supporters, and BBM is Bon Bon Marcos, Marcos Jr., the dictator's son. These forces have dominated social media. The opposition voices have been uh, fewer and uh, uh, less uh, influential. And opposition with institutions, courts, uh, and particularly, of course, the legislature has faded. By contrast, in Thailand, you've seen growing opposition since the 2014 coup, strong opposition parties that were highly competitive in 2019, uh, and are, with Puyatai, likely to win, according to most estimates, uh, the forthcoming vote in May 2023. We've also seen protests, the flash mob protests, almost continuously, or periodically anyway, since the 2014 coup, and then, of course, the sustained youth protests of 2020 uh, and 21. Interestingly, too, in social media, some scholars have argued that actually the opposition has an advantage to uh, the pro-regime uh, social media uh, has been much less successful in uh, influencing people. And there seems to be some institutional support or some growing institutional support from a low base, evidently, on this uh, uh, evident divisions within the military. Okay, so what is it that I want to discuss in this specific comparison? Uh, first of all, let me just talk about the two cases because the contrasts are so apparent that uh, perhaps the similarities will be a bit surprising. Um, and I'll talk about the uh, Philippine case next in terms of disguising autocratization. And I'll suggest that in the Philippines you find both uh, this plebiscitary disguise way back in the Commonwealth period, which I'll talk about, um, and under Duterte's strongman rule, but also the promissory disguise. And even though it wasn't a military coup, Marcos's martial law rule was a kind of self coup in Autobahn in 1972. In Thailand, we've had a number of promissory coups. 57, 58, 76, 91, uh, and the series of anti-Texan coups. Also the Otto Golpe, although this time by, by the military in 1971, and Texans' executive aggrandizement and aggrandizement in the 2000s. So in terms of calling out autocratization in these two countries from the Cold War to the present, we saw peak opposition, in other words, very strong opposition in the Philippines in the early 1950s, making kind of an historical point here, and also during uh, the so-called people power uprising uh, in 1986. The strongest opposition in Thailand was uh, arguably October 1973, uh, the Black May uh, uh, events of 1992, and I would suggest since 2019. And therefore, we see some striking historical uh, similarities between the cases, I would suggest, uh, although there's a very interesting and important contemporary difference Okay, so just to speak briefly about these two cases. Uh, one of the interesting things to point out is, of course, there is a discourse, and of course many countries have this discourse, the U.S., of course, uh, famously. Um, but there is a kind of theology of Thai exceptionalism, as some scholars have argued. How can you compare Thailand? It's so distinct, and every country is, of course, very distinct in some ways, but uh, that's been played up. Japan would be another country, of course, that has a, a kind of discourse like this. The Philippines, by contrast, tends to be considered very un-Southeast Asian. In fact, there was an early textbook just after the World War II written uh, about Southeast Asia that excluded the Philippines. And it was only the grad students of this professor, a uh, British professor named Paul, who uh, encouraged him to include the Philippines in the next uh, edition. So the Philippines seems as a uh, predominantly Catholic country, uh, uh, an outlier uh, religiously in the region, and it's also been seen politically and economically over time as an outlier. One interesting similarity is this discourse of Thailand's unfinished revolution uh, since 1932, uh, and the Philippines have that sense of an interrupted revolution, interrupted because it was uh, successful against the Spanish, but then double-crossed by the Americans, who then colonized the Philippines for a second time in the late 19th, or early 20th centuries. And there are some interesting structural similarities despite these deep historical and cultural differences, obviously the religious differences. Uh, one uh, some scholars have pointed to uh, is the integration of ethnic Chinese, uh, helping create a self-confident business class, and something that uh, Dr. you've written around about in Seidel as well, in the Philippine case about 
the links between democratization and the rise of these uh, political families or political bosses. Uh, there's also, I would suggest, a interesting politicization of social class. Uh, Toxin's pro poor uh, discourse is somewhat kind of comparable to a Philippine president named Joseph Estrada, who I'll mention uh, briefly. And crucially for this comparison here, both countries have gone through several cycles of relatively brief, generally, periods of democracy and uh, uh, recurring autocratization. And this has occurred uh, in the interwar period, in the Cold War period, and in the contemporary, what I would suggest could be called populist periods. So to turn to the Philippine case first in terms of autocratization's disguise, uh, there is a the first Philippine president uh, under the American colonial period. There were presidents during the um, uh, revolution, uh, but um, since American colonialism and the establishment of a commonwealth, you had an elected president in 1935, uh, President Manuel Quezon, and he quickly turned a, a democratic system into a plebiscitary one, uh, which he termed partyless democracy. No need for political parties. Uh, I, my rule is sufficient uh, to guide the country. Uh, and uh, we had this precedent set for uh, executive aggrandizement at that time. It was only World War II that kept him from establishing a longer-term dictatorship than the scholars have argued, the, the invasion of the Japanese in particular. Then you have, skipping ahead to 1972, Marcos Sr. This is Ferdinand Marcos, the father of the current president. Uh, he had been elected president in 1965, re-elected in 1969, and as it's his term neared its end, he decided to declare martial law, an auto golpe uh, in the Latin American term, uh, promising to restore stability, create a new society, as he called it, and justified it with what he called um, the, the tatana, meaning the fate of the nation, something that's more culturally appropriate. And there's been some interesting recent research uh, on this issue, and Marcos was, in a sense, proposing a culturally uh, appropriate form of democracy, uh, which is very different than the pluralist uh, liberal definitions that political scientists uh, generally uh, like to use to understand what democracy is. Then skipping ahead again, uh, we have a uh, relatively uh, little known or perhaps uh, better said for, uh, often forgotten second people power uprising, but this uh, in 2001 was not against the dictator as the original people power in 1986 was, but rather against the freely and fairly elected Joseph Estrada, this pro-poor populist in, in the Philippine case. And then we have the blood, uh, bloody drug war, which uh, Duterte launched in 2016 to end disorder he blamed on irresponsible elites. Uh, he denounced human rights defenders as traitors standing in the way of this program of cleaning up the Philippines, you know, getting rid of criminals, uh, and uh, you know, evading a, a very inefficient justice system. It's too slow to bring criminals to justice, so extrajudicial killings were uh, quite openly justified in that context. And uh, thousands, or perhaps even tens of thousands, were killed uh, during his presidency. He aggrandized his power, aside from the, the drug war itself and the violence involved, with no overt institutional change, but rather heavy intimidation of opposition and lawfare, particularly suits. Uh, uh, cyber libel suits were very common against a number of oppositionists. Some were removed from uh, the Senate. Uh, one oppositionist in particular, Lila de Lima, is removed from the Senate, uh, still in jail to this day, uh, with uh, trumped up charges, it seems, of uh, being involved in the drug trade herself uh, after she had criticized the detectives' drug war. Well, the only senator to do so in a very high profile way. Uh, Duterte enjoyed record popularity. And his allies, as I mentioned, swept the midterm election, particularly the Senate, in 2019. And of course, as you all know, Marcos Jr. won by a landslide, more than twice as many votes as his nearest competitor in 2022. And he has opposed this International Criminal Court investigation of the drug war, suggesting that this, uh, Ill, these are liberal policies which uh, downgrade human rights will, will continue. So what about the Thai case? And again, uh, as where Jacques suggested, I'm interested in the Thai comparison, but uh, my, my feet feel much less firm, so I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to any comments about how I may have misinterpreted uh, recent Thai history. Uh, 
Uh, I would start with the General Saritz uh, ruling in 1958 and this idea of Thai style democracy and drawing here on the ideas of uh, Hughes and Little. Uh, then you have Tanom's 1971 Ato Golpe. Uh, you have the massacre of 1976 and the coup. Uh, and then, very interesting and important period, I think, in recent Thai history, democracy as it's been called, uh, from 1980 to 88. After a brief democratic period from 1988, the 1990 coup was justified as uh, necessary against this corrupt so-called buffet cabinet, or this very corrupt uh, cabinet, necessary to restore good governance. You had the caretaker government, 1991-92, with wise technocrats ruling in the interests of the nation, it was claimed. And then the next aggrandizing uh, uh, period was Thaksin's aggrandizement of power, after his election in 2001, very subtle process, but was called out also for the corruption of his regime. And then the coups of 2006, the backdoor coup of 2008, and the most recent coup of 2014, were all preceded by anti-Taksin mass mobilization by civil society groups, who were, of course, attacking corruption, uh, paving the way for a military monarchical rule of good people, as opposed to these uh, corrupt politicians, and can be understood in a sense, is another variation of this Thai style, uh, culturally appropriate. In other words, not Western style democracy, Thai style uh, democracy. Okay, so now I turn to the issue of uh, how these uh, autocratizing disguises can actually be called out. So again, to go back into Philippine history, uh, there is a uh, Philippine president, the second after Philippine independence in 1946, uh, named El Padillo Carino. Uh, he had resorted to uh, political violence and cheating to win the 1949 election, uh, which caused uh, a considerable outrage in the opposition. This was worsened in the midterm elections two years later when an opposition, this is a local politician, Moises Padillo, was uh, brutally murdered by uh, one of uh, Carino's local allies, a warlord. And so although warlord violence is common in the Philippines, and there's been a recent case of it, uh, as some of you may have seen in Negros Oriental, uh, when it occurs around an election like this, and it's particularly brutal, then this can also channel uh, opposition uh, outrage. And so a savior, a political savior, and I use that term not totally coincidentally in a Christian country like the Philippines, emerges, uh, his name is Ramon uh, Magsaysay, uh, and he uh, did a grassroots campaign and promised to uh, to, to rid the Philippines of this political violence, to rid it of its uh, manipulated elections, to restore uh, liberal democracy, and he won by a landslide in 1953. Then jumping ahead to the protests of the mid-1980s, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Marcos Sr. had uh, established a dictatorship via martial law, and he had not held elections until 1978, and although these elections were rigged, and this rigging led to protest itself. Uh, the opposition did participate, but uh, was largely cheated, decided to boycott the 1981 presidential election. But then after the Aquino assassination, really had this huge moral outrage. So Benigno Aquino, for those of you who don't know this aspect of Philippine history, was considered by many to be the leading oppositionist. Uh, he was an exile in the US at, at the time. He was a former senator. He had um, written quite a bit about justifying his opposition to Marcos. He decides to return the country, to the country in August 1983 against the advice of his advisors, who say it's dangerous, and they turned out to be right. He was assassinated at the airport. He was actually taken off the plane and shot uh, as he was you know, going down the ladder from the plane, and journalists were in the plane uh, able to document this. This triggered huge outrage in the Philippines and even uh, global concern about the Philippines. So you had this triggering event, as I mentioned earlier. And mass protests began immediately. There's a huge funeral with millions attend for, for the assassinated uh, opposition leader. And the protests basically continue uh, almost on a daily basis until Marcos is overthrown in early 1986. And interesting, and I talked about this vernacularized discourse, you see Filipino oppositionists using this Christian discourse of the passion, the passion, Christ's passion. Uh, so Aquino had willingly sacrificed his life. He had known that he faced danger, was willing to go back. Uh, the comparisons were made to Jose Rizal, the national hero who had gone back uh, despite 
uh, Spanish authorities seeking his arrest, and he was eventually executed uh, in, at the very end of the Spanish colonial regime, but also even to, to Christ himself. That, you know, this is uh, while Christ was sacrificing himself for humankind, Rizal and now Aquino were sacrificing themselves for the nation. So this Christian uh, discourse is used, and this idea is um, uh, analyzed by an important Philippine historian, uh, Ray Aleto, who has written about the Passion as an anti colonial, uh, an instrument of anti colonial resistance, uh, and now we see it in, in terms of resistance to the Marcos dictatorship. So after the uh, Marcos holds a snap presidential elections, he just calls them suddenly in 1986, sort of in a typo, uh, and the opposition has a new organization called NAMFRO, the uh, National Movement for Free Elections. They do an alternative count, and they claim to document that the opposition led by the widow of uh, Benigno Aquino, Cory Aquino, has actually won uh, the election, and he, she's been cheated. And so shortly thereafter, there's a failed military coup against Marcos, but then this people power uprising, which toppled his regime, which the Catholic Church, which had been strongly backing uh, this uprising, declares a miracle. So back to this uh, Christian uh, imagery. Then you have uh, supporters, again skipping ahead now to the Estrada period, supporters of the deposed president Estrada in the second people power, so-called people power, it's actually a people power coup, in 2001, uh, they are demand his re uh, installment in power, and this People Power Three is often called Poor People's People Power because the supporters of Estrada come out rather spontaneously. It's a huge crowd that gathers very quickly, uh, and uh, although it did not succeed, it was a major uh, mobilization in recent Philippine politics. Uh, there were additional protests after Estrada's friend and fellow famous movie star. I should have mentioned that. Estrada was a movie star who turned his fans into voters. Uh, in that sense, the comparison to Taxi is a little bit different. Taxi is the CEO uh, figure. Uh, Estrada is the movie star, and his friend uh, Fernando Poe Jr. was also an even more famous movie star called the Filipino John Wayne by some. He ran against uh, Estrada's successor, and uh, many people claimed he was cheated. There was doubts about that uh, claim until the so-called Hello Garcia scandal occurs which, uh, in which uh, the, the incumbent president, uh, Gloria Macabagal Arroyo, is caught on tape basically saying, did you get the votes? Did you get the million votes I needed to win? Uh, which was taken as evidence that in fact she cheated. Uh, and then to the Duterte regime, we've seen the large protests against uh, Duterte's drug war initially in the first year and a half or so. Particularly uh, important after the killing of a schoolboy was documented on CCTV. Uh, unarmed, uh, not involved in drugs, and was just caught up in the dragnet of this, uh, these killings that were going on. There would be dozens of killings every day uh, in Manila during this period. Extrajudicial killings by police or, or un unknown vigilantes who were uh, often assumed to be linked somehow to the police. Uh, so there were protests against that. There was some outrage. Opposition politicians, leftist groups, and the Catholic Church were involved. But then uh, the Duterte's popularity, he apologized to the family, a couple of policemen were put on trial, although they've not yet gone to jail, uh, or not been sentenced uh, finally to jail, and the uh, higher-ups uh, were not uh, actually charged. Uh, so Duterte was able to recover from that. Uh, strong support on social media played an important role in, in that as well. And as I said, they were then shut out of the 2019 senatorial elections, which is the first time opposition had won no seats uh, since uh, case on what I mentioned in the uh, 1941 election. And they lost massively, as I said, to Marcos Jr. in 2022. What about the Thai case in terms of calling out uh, autocratization? Uh, again, going back to the history, after the 1971 Golpe and the Tanon administration, uh, or as it was sometimes called the tyrannical trio, some of you will recall that, uh, it, was, it seemed to show that they wanted absolute power indefinitely and in hopes of democratic restoration. And so this discontent builds up, and you have these uh, huge protests in October 1973 after uh, several students have been arrested. Uh, it, the brutal killings of several protesters causes increasing moral outrage and speeds democratization. 1992, you have General Suchinda, the 
who had led the coup, saying he's uh, not interested in staying in power after elections, and yet he does, uh, thus breaking a promise to relinquish power. And then Chum Long, if you remember his role in that, that period, uh, does invoke uh, a kind of Buddhist image. So you have a kind of vernacularized appeal here, uh, trampling on virtue. I'm, I'm uh, using the uh, article here of Rossi, who, who analyzed this kind of vernacularized appeal that, uh, within a Buddhist context of uh, Chum Long and others in the opposition were using uh, to discredit uh, military rule at that time. Of course, the uh, killings of protesters in the Black Main massacre causes outrage. Uh, and with the monarchy's intervention, the democratic transition begins and results in the uh, 1997 Constitution, which has been claimed probably in many ways correctly as, as the most progressive in, in the country's history. Then you have, uh, and it would be interesting to hear your reactions to this, you have the red shirt appropriation of terms within time, uh, talking about uh, you know, common people versus elites, and there's been a lot of discussion about how accurate this is historically, but I think Tong Chai's argument is interesting that, that this discourse is resuscitated and it gives this uh, kind of you know, idea of the oppressed many against the uh, uh, unjust few, that the downtrodden folks uh, are facing uh, injustice from uh, the privileged. So this is a kind of discourse which is not vernacularized in the religious sense, but in the class sense. We are campaigning for ordinary people. This is not some political science definition of democracy. This is you know, something that matters to ordinary people. That's the kind of discourse that you find uh, among red shirts in, those, uh, in that time. You have outrage at the 2010 uh, red shirt killings, of course, and many have argued this, was, this helped fuel Puyotai's uh, win in the 2011 elections. Uh, skipping ahead to 2019, again, the strong opposition performance there. Uh, by the pro Taksin party, as well as the new urban class-based uh, future forward party, uh, which had been created shortly before that. With the electoral rigging or charges thereof, the banning of FFP, and the assassination of several exiles, you uh, see, can see these as triggers uh, for the youth protests, which, of course, also transgress the taboo of not criticizing the monarchy, uh, therefore seen as very unusual in the Thai political context. Controversial, to say the least. Ah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, recently, the Thai High Court has limited Prayut's time as Prime Minister, and there's been an obvious split within the military leadership. Puyo Thai seems to be ahead, or opinion polls show it ahead, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, the discussions of a landslide or Puyo Thai's claim that they're bound for a landslide seem at least plausible. Although, and actually, this is your turn for talking. <laughs> A murky compromise may be the result uh, after these elections. But at the moment, the opposition, Puyotai, and I didn't talk about a move forward party uh, that came, comes out of future forward party. They're also, of course, and that's my competition as a speaker, they also seem very uh, uh, confident that they can uh, achieve a result somewhat similar to how they uh, performed, which was surprisingly well in the 2019 election. Drawing on this general anti uh, government sentiment. So there, there, com there is competition within in, in the op opposition. There's the Puyatai uh, brand of opposition, which is the larger group, clearly, but the uh, Move Forward Party also offers uh, a clear alternative, and both are banking on that sentiment to, to fuel their electoral successes. So I see some striking similarities, despite these obvious differences between the two cases, beginning with these cycles of autocratization and democracy. I think, at least within Southeast Asia, this is quite unique. Uh, perhaps one can look to certain Latin American cases to see some similarities, or, or in Africa. But in Southeast Asia, it is quite striking how you get these, these, this back and forth between the two. And both countries have had coups, or auto golpe, uh, using this promissory disguise, uh, Marcus's martial law, and the many Thai coups, uh, which claim performance legitimacy and have generally invoked culture to discredit Western democracy. I talked about the Tadhana uh, excuse in the Philippines, excuse, sorry, justification in the Philippines, that it's the fate of Filipino people to have a democracy distinct from the West, or Thai style democracy, which the name itself suggests what it's all about. Democracy appropriate to Thais in Thailand, not Western alien democracy. 
Uh, and then we've seen executive aggrandizers and plebiscitary disguise, largely in the Philippines. Quezon, the Commonwealth president, I spoke about Duterte, Marcos Jr., but in Thailand we also have the case of Pakistan's premiership. Uh, both countries have also seen strong electoral challenges by the opposition, with mass movements involved in overthrowing dictatorships in Thailand, the uh, 1973 uprising, which I discussed, the Black May events in 1992. In the Philippines, uh, you had people power, sorry, this is a mistake, 1986, it should read, and another less well-known uh, is the uh, People Power Three Uprising, Poor People's People Power of 2001. This was in defense of the pro-poor populist uh, deposed President Joseph Estrada. But there's a key contemporary difference, which is, of course, what I'm really interested in trying to explain here. Uh, and this may seem a little confusing the way I'm using this term, but I would suggest we see a kind of post-populist opposition in Thailand. Uh, a very strong post populist opposition. Let me explain what I mean. So to start with the Philippines, you see uh, Duterte and Marcos Jr. having strong electoral legitimacy. They won elections easily. Uh, actually, Duterte's victory in 2016 was relatively close, but as I said, his allies swept the midterms, and Marcos Jr. won by an over two to one margin in 2022. This is a very good disguise for autocratization. I have the support of the people. What are you complaining about? Uh, and this despite human rights violations, most obvious under Duterte, but not uh, being forcefully pushed back against under Marcos Jr., even though the tone has changed, less aggressive kind of uh, tone, the drug war has been de-emphasized. And I would also argue, and I could, we can talk about this if there's interest in during the discussion, relatively poor performance, including during the pandemic, where the Philippines has uh, one of the worst lockdowns in the world, but it doesn't stop the spread of the disease because of lack of uh, tracing and testing, uh, and uh, therefore very uh, high, a, a large fall in economic growth and even uh, some levels of, of hunger uh, that increase. So performance has been poor right now, the inflation is very high in the Philippines as it is here, but the government has been incapable of keeping the prices of key food stuff, stuffs down. That doesn't seem to be hurting the, the popularity of Marcos Jr. as it didn't seem to be hurting Duterte. So I'm suggesting this plebiscitary legitimacy, uh, this disguise of autocratization is very effective still. In Thailand, uh, by contrast, after the 2014 coup, you saw obvious institutional and, in 2019, electoral manipulation, although you could go back to the constitutional referendum as well, uh, which caused increasing moral outrage directed at what it's, I think, fair to say, a growing view that uh, government has performed poorly, including during the pandemic, although compared to the Philippines, Thailand performed relatively well in terms of excess deaths and, and controlling and testing and tracing and so on. Nonetheless, the resentment against the government during the pandemic undoubtedly grew. Uh, the opposition has succeeded uh, quite uh, um, clearly in calling out autocratization through strong electoral competition by parties that have remained resilient. Uh, both Puyatai and uh, Future Forward, of course, have been banned at various points. They were resuscitated, and these successor parties have been strong. Uh, I've talked about the youth protests despite repression, and also the co-optation co of uh, previous forms of civil society organization. And this is my point about post-populism. So, I'm, I'm suggesting that the populist divide, the taxon, anti taxon forces in particular, has been maybe largely is exaggerated, but somewhat bridged. Uh, as you see, a once incredibly hostile urban middle class, uh, particularly in Bangkok, but also in other major urban centers in Thailand, uh, moving toward the opposition, parts of it, uh, and not necessarily going for Puyatai or pro taxon parties, but voting for the opposition. And this is, of course, the niche that uh, Future Forward Move Forward has found. Uh, and so that you see people voting for opposition, uh, even if they had originally uh, been quite uh, hostile for taxon. At the same time, we see these divisions within the military emerging. And this is crucial. All major parties in the 2023 elections seem to be making taxon style social program promises, which are generally called populism. 
But my point is populism as a huge political cleavage has kind of, kind of disappeared because everybody seems to agree on the kind of, of pro-welfare populist programs that Thaksin uh, talked about. That's not what people are arguing about anymore. Uh, the, the argument is more about a military uh, versus civilian rule. That seems to be the crucial factor. It was in 2019 and it continues to be in these forthcoming elections. And this is very dissimilar to what you see in the Philippines, where Marcos Jr. has, yes, moved beyond some of Duterte's most uh, outspoken anti-drug war, uh, drug war rhetoric uh, and uh, attacks on other political opponents, attacks on the left and so on, uh, and called for unity, uh, but at the same time uh, de-emphasized human rights. So this is a kind of uh, illiberal uh, unity you see in the Philippines with very little opposition against that. I can get into detail, but there's only one really, I would identify as only one opposition senator and a handful in the House of Representatives, very weak media presence, and no identifiable social movement uh, mobilized against the regime uh, at the moment. So in conclusion, I've argued that uh, Thailand has an energized opposition able to channel moral outrage, the youth, youth protests, and resilient uh, parties contesting elections, uh, which has undermined the coup regime's promissory disguise by calling out broken promises, its institutional hypocrisy, its poor performance, and the anti-liberal uh, democratic nature of its rule. Philippine opposition by chance is becalmed, parties are weak, protest movements mobilize, uh, they've been unable to unveil, as it were, or to rip off the disguise of this plebiscitory leadership, uh, you have one strong man, Marcos Jr., replacing another, Duterte, uh, with human rights uh, denounced under Duterte, de-emphasized under Marcos Jr. And this contrasts with this broad civilian consensus against military rule in Thailand, whereas in the Philippines at the moment, liberals or liberal Democrats are seen as elitist, uh, with the majority backing a kind of illiberal uh, policy of unity. So thank you very much, and I look forward to comments. This is some of the literature I used uh, for preparing this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, talk. Uh, very insightful and you know, well informed and good comparison. Uh, most of you know scholars who study Thailand tend to study Thailand, you know, as a close country country, not, you know, many uh, good comparative studies. Uh, so I believe there are, you know, questions uh, from those of you who, you know, with us in the room and also some questions if you have uh, online, you can send it uh, to the staff, okay, uh, and I will ask those questions uh, for you. So. Uh, anyone would like to start mm -hmm. the floor? Perhaps uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Shani Okay, uh, thank you. I, I thought that you're going to shine the spotlight on me uh, straight to, uh, when we go into Q&A. So, uh, thanks Mark, that's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> and um, lots of, uh, you highlighted a lot of interesting points. So um, I was just wondering, um, why do we go th through these cycles? I mean, you, you know, um, you've been talking about throughout history that, that there's been calling out, um, and you know, there's these key ingredients like triggering events, social movements, media, and all that, so on and so forth. But why do we go? What what makes us go through these cycles, and why can't we go beyond these cycles, or otherwise? Um, why can't we form a, a kind of like a stable, I'm not calling it a Western uh, democracy, but can, can we establish some sort of democracy? Yeah, that, I mean, thanks, I mean, that's a great question. And it's a different question I was trying to answer. And I would refer here to some of the writings of uh, uh, Federico Ferrara, who has uh, not talked about the Philippine case, but about the Thai case. Uh, and he's made some interesting comparisons to early 20th century Italy. And so if you look at various countries' histories, you have periods of recurring political turbulence. 
Uh, although Thailand and the Philippines have to be pretty competitive in the fact that they've uh, been at this for, uh, depending how you how you define it, uh, well over half a uh, century, uh, perhaps even longer in the case of the Philippines, going back to the Commonwealth, is nearly uh, now a century of, of back and forth. Um, so I would point to a variety of factors. Uh, one of them is you know, this authoritarian temptation and the fact that strongman rulers and or you know, groups that think that they can step in and justify their you know, overturning the system in the name of promises of a better future, uh, that at various times in both Thai and Philippine history have proved very attractive. Uh, that in turn suggests uh, the weakness of democracies, real existing democracy. If we look at Thailand between 73 and 76, or 1988 to 1991, undoubtedly democracy had its difficulties. Um, but if you're looking for some, and same is true of the Philippines, uh, some Filipino scholars were asking themselves not why did Marcos declare martial law in 1972, but why did it not occur earlier, right? Because there were so many dysfunctional elements of Philippine democracy. And similarly, with Duterte's aggrandizement, you know, people would point, and I was among them, to the problems of Philippine democracy. So that's that's another factor. But if you're looking for signs of change, then I think one could possibly make an optimistic case about Thailand if certain issues of the past, the extreme polarization that came out of the Thaksin era, if we see signs that that, and even that, if it, that involves a murky compromise, uh, if there's some signs that those, uh, that political polarization can be overcome and there can be some sort of institutionalized memory of the problems intervention causes, overturning the system causes, if the past nine years are not just quickly uh, uh, forgotten, uh, assuming that there is a political change uh, and a, a, a restoration of what one could reasonably call a, a liberal democracy of some sort, or of uh, moving toward that uh, goal anyway, um, you know that 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 might that might help uh, uh, secure it. And you know, I think I think very basic level an acceptance of majoritarianism, even as the forces who win elections have to accept, and this is the problem in the Philippines, that even if you win elections that are, are riding high in the opinion polls, you still have to accept certain constraints, particularly on human rights, right? So uh, that, I see very little indication of that occurring anytime soon in the Philippines, whereas in Thailand, I see more, I would be more hopeful that, um, you know, the idea of majoritarianism would be more, uh, uh, could become uh, more strongly institutionalized in the near future, which would bode well for uh, a, a long-term stability of, uh, of democracy. That's obviously speculation, but uh, you know, based on current trends, that would be the optimistic take. Good to hear some optimistic view <laughs> during this day. <laughs> that uh, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, go ahead. That's absolutely true. I was just wondering whether you you uh, are you optimistic about the future in comparison to the Philippine case. Look like. Okay, Thailand has a, at least a path forward, right, for democratization. Mm -hmm. Despite of the fact that it might not be, uh, you know, strong democratic Thailand yet, uh, soon, immediately after the election, but we go into that direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Good to have students here uh, with us. Yes. Uh, first of all, in last year, Bongo Mangkosi has been the election. Yeah, I think why people uh, forgot the, his father, Ferdinand uh, Mangkosi, did it and he escaped the country in 1986. He lived, <laughs> he escaped to Hawaii and for me, I Things I compare my God to Rasin in 2006, uh, the ultra loyal system protest in Rasin and the soldier, the army, came to coup in 2006 and Rasin as the country. And I think in this year, this is interesting to Panantesh in a way. She had 
would try to bring it further, further back. Yeah, I think this campaign is win the whole country, right, last night. Uh, I want to ask you why people uh, forgot the history and still show the same family to rise up to uh, rule the power in this country. Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a very interesting question. It's a very different kind of comparison than I was making. Uh, and just to rephrase what I understood your question to be, so you have, in a sense, Filipino voters, majority of them, forgetting the past. I mean, Marcos, we shouldn't forget, was toppled, not just after the killing of uh, Aquino, the opposition leader, in 1983, by clearly people linked to the regime, even if Marcos may not have ordered it himself. Uh, and there was no uh, thorough investigation. That investigation was uh, very much limited by the regime. Uh, and But there was also economic collapse. So the, the country went into deep, uh, uh, what can fairly be called a depression, and it took basically two decades for the country to recover. It's, it's somewhat similar to the sad story of Sri Lanka right now, where that country has gone into a tailspin. Uh, and so you see a uh, country taking decades to recover. Uh, and so how is it that you know people would forget that uh, you know obvious economic and political failures and have this nostalgic view and a lot of people have been talking about how that reflects on the failings of Philippine democracy and that people however um, problematic the Marcos years may have been it's a kind of useful idea for them to think well at least it was better than the present which uh, for many Filipinos given the high levels of inequality, even though there's been some growth in the last two decades, high levels of inequality, corruption, inefficiency of government, and so on. Uh, and so that authoritarian nostalgia has been an issue. And you've drawn an analogy of that to Paxson with all his flaws, and now, you know, looks like his party's victory may be a prelude to, to try and get for him to come back, and, and whether he'd go to jail, and so on and so forth is, is being discussed. But, that, that's a very interesting uh, comparison. Um, I mean, I think that, the, and the other interesting thing point is, of course, both uh, drew strong majorities, right? The uh, Marcos Jr. Uh, had a massive presidential election win, and it looks like Putin Todd is headed for that. So it's a kind of interesting question. Um, but one difference I would say is I'm not sure how much historical revisionism is going on in the Thai case. Because, I mean, it's just so fresh in people's minds. The anti-toxin, pro-toxin, anti-toxin conflict has been so, so much at the center of Thai politics for the last 20 years that I think hardly anybody could be accused of engaging in sort of fantasy, fantasy-full nostalgia. People know uh, what they got with, uh, with, with toxin. The supporters stay strongly committed to him as opponents have remained critical, although some, even though so critical, facts have been willing to vote for the opposition, which is, I think, an important point. Um, so I don't think it involves uh, so much authoritarian nostalgia, but I would agree with you there, there are some interesting uh, comparisons. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. But in, in the Philippine case, uh, as far as I understand, it's not forgetting the history, right? But the Marcos Jr. attempts safely manipulating the, the history through the social media, rewriting the, the history, uh, and uh, seems like very sophisticated uh, campaign uh, that they, uh, you know, intentionally uh, rewrite the history and use that uh, rewritten path to you know, help that campaign, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and I don't see that in the Thai case. Um, you know, it was a classic case of historical revisionism. And even, you know, I mean, Marcos himself has been clever about not making, he, he, he won't say he's got nothing to apologize for, but there are also the massive human rights violations that occurred during his father's martial law rule. Um, so he's not gonna apologize for that. But he's not the one himself claiming, well, it was a golden age, but his supporters are. Mm -hmm. And they're claiming it was an economic golden age, which there was some growth at the beginning of the martial law regime, but of course at the end there was economic collapse. Uh, there were all these political problems 
huge amount of instability and, and the killing of this opposition leader and, and so on. Armed insurgency grew under his rule and so on. So it was a classic case of repackaging history and it was done in a sophisticated manner. The one thing I would say though, to some who would argue that's why the Philippines is in such democratic trouble because of social media, mm -hmm. but I would say you know, social media really doesn't go deep enough as an explanation. It may accelerate this trend, but people were open to that kind of argument because they were so discontented, back to your question, with the democratic present uh, that they were open to sort of reinterpretation of the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to have a willing audience for that mm -hmm. kind of narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've said to the audience, yes. we're listening to it, said this time. Uh, yeah, we retain history. Uh, we have another colleague with us. Uh, Dr. Naim, uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, actually, I don't have the right to ask questions because I miss uh, most of your presentation. But nevertheless, I, I want to ask your permission to uh, following questions of our students. Uh, I was uh, wondering about the political implication of having a family dynasty or political family in a Thai democratic system. Uh, we have a Shinawat family. And also at the local level, we also have a, what we call Banyan, like a big house or big family. What are those implications to the democratic system in Thailand? And the second question is just my, uh, I'm wondering why is it more problematic in terms of family, political family in Asian context than the Western context? Because I think in the Western context, they also have family. Right. Bush family, Clinton family, but we tend to ask this question to the Asian or you know less democratic context more than the Western democratic context. Why? Why it's so problematic here? I'm not sure whether it's problematic or not, but I'm just wondering why. Why is this questions here in, in, in Thailand or in Philippines? Why not in Western countries? Family. Thank you. Yeah, that, uh, thanks for that. It goes well beyond what I've discussed here, but I'm so happy to, do, to address it particularly as I've done research uh, on another class of dynasty that you then mentioned. That's, and although I mentioned briefly when I talked about horizontal chemo, these are the female dynasties who often succeed a uh, assassinated, executed father or husband. Uh, and so chemo in the Philippines, or, or uh, an exiled uh, uh, brother. <laughs> Uh, or an exiled father, so you see this in the Thai context as well, uh, in the Shinawat family. Uh, Indonesia, remember Megawati Sukarnoputri, the daughter of Sukarno, uh, and uh, Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, uh, Indira Gandhi in India, uh, and so on. So uh, that's been a very interesting phenomenon. Um, in the West, since you made that comparison, dynasties are most prevalent, uh, I think it's fair to say, in recent times anyway, although there's been historical precedence as well in the US. And a lot of people have attributed that to the weakness of American parties. Although American parties are pretty strong these days in terms of partisan attachments, but uh, organizationally. So if, if the organization is weak, then your family background is of greater uh, political advantage. Uh, and so um, I think that helps explain the, the Clinton, the Bush dynasties, and, and there are also a number of uh, dynasties at state levels. Um, and so maybe going to the Asian context, that helps us understand why, besides Thailand and the Philippines, let's not forget India, of course, and Japan, other very prominent cases, there's been increasing discussion in Indonesian politics of the importance of dynasties. Uh, so, you know, and those, I think, probably by a lot of scholars would be linked to, to weak party structures. So, it's not so much Asia as it is the, the nature of, of political parties. Uh, and then going to your first question, the Banyai question, um, as important as they are in the Thai context, I would argue the Philippine uh, comparison makes one realize how they are more limited in influence here than, than elsewhere. So in the Philippines, you know, you have a relatively weak state. The Thai state is traditionally, and I didn't talk about this, and Pajak and I have been uh, discussing this quite a bit. I think it's very important to understand that despite all its limitations, the Thai state is uh, much stronger uh, in a number of ways, and one way is controlling political violence, controlling the influence of arbitrary behavior by political families. I mentioned there's a massacre uh, 
in what was generally considered a peaceful province in the Philippines recently, uh, which and the, this has been preceded by a number of other killings. So the, the, the Philippine state is less capable of stepping in and preempting. The Philippine state will come in after it's gotten so embarrassingly bad, like the massacre of 2009, as some of you will remember, the Abatuan family uh, 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 killed 58 people, uh, including uh, over 30 journalists, which is a shocking incident. Um, so there, there are more constraints, and arguably, too, related to my idea of resilient parties. That, that you know, I think it's fair to say future forward, move forward, is, is less, much less dependent on this kind of uh, family structure. And uh, even Puyatai, one could argue, even though obviously they have these big families involved in them, in, in their uh, uh, party and in their campaign, they're subordinated to the larger leadership. That said, of course, there's a political family at the top of Puyatai, no denying that. Uh, but every Philippine party, by the way, is run by a, a major political family. So, uh, you know, you have a series of Puyatai-like parties in, in the Philippines. Uh, and there's really no equivalent to move forward party in the Philippines in the current context. So in, in, the Phil in Thailand, at least, there is an alternative model uh, there. Um, so I, I, I would accept the point that, that, that they're important and, you know, their influence can be seen as problematic because it corrupts governance. And remember, I talked about the Buffet Cabinet in 1988. That was a classic example of where uh, these uh, dynasties, factions, and so on were just feeding at the at the trough, right? Uh, and that undermined the legitimacy of a, a democratically elected government. So it can be a problem uh, for governance, but uh, compared to the Philippines in Thailand, there are more constraints, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'd like to know uh, what role, uh, if any, you see other democracies playing in uh, maybe helping the Philippines and Thailand reversing these uh, autocratic trends? Do you think there's any, any constructive role that other democracies can play? Thanks for that. Again, far beyond what I was considering here, but I'm happy to, to take a stab at it. Um, it is telling with all due respect to Joe Biden and his democracy project, then Rodrigo Duterte was invited to his first democracy summit. Um, so, when Thailand was. It, it's, it's an interesting comparison, yeah. So, um, that's, you know, one sort of the club of democracies. Uh, U.S. always tends to send out invitations, not just based on your democratic credentials, but your standing vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Uh, in the geopolitical sense of things. Um, the Philippine case is quite interesting because U.S. influence has been massive, starting with American colonialism, of course, and the Cold War links are huge, and Marcos declares martial law with full American backing, basically, uh, and very reluctant American disengagement allows him to fall in 1986. In fact, Reagan was quite close to the Marcos couple and was not too happy about what the State Department was doing uh, in terms of uh, distancing the government from, from the Marcos regime. Um, Duterte takes a sharp anti-American term, uh, term, at least rhetorically, discursively, uh, and does make some uh, noise about ending some military commitments. Um, he comes under pressure from his own military, uh, and uh, the U.S. kind of plays it cool, even though he ca called Obama, I don't know if anybody caught that, <laughs> a, a bad word. Um, and so he was, uh, you know, trying to show his independence. And, and by the way, Duterte uh, was part of a long but some often overlooked highly nationalistic tradition of the Philippines, which is understandable given colonialism and U.S. law and so on. Uh, and so that actually made him quite popular across various parts of the political spectrum. But the concerns about China uh, and so on, particularly in the military, wound up pushing him back into the American camp. And as you may know, the Marcos Jr. has uh, allowed the Americans closer access. The cost of that, though, is the Americans are very close to Marcos Jr. Kamala Harris was there recently, and I don't expect any sort of criticisms. And this ICC case, which Philippine human rights campaigners are very concerned about, because that would bring Duterte and others involved in the drug war to international justice, 
that's of course also being opposed by Marcos. So I think the geopolitical alignment is such. In Thailand, I again, others may, in the audience may know better than I do, but my sense also is that other democracies are not that uh, that that actively concerned one way or the other. Uh, obviously, in, in U.S. And, and certain parts of Western Europe, there'd be preferences for a, uh, a more democratic form of government after this election. Uh, I think there's no doubt about that, and it would probably lead to a, uh, a warming of ties in some sense. Um, but, uh, and, and then the final factor I'd stress is, and this is something I wrote about, about Duterte, is you know, with the rise of China, with China's growing influence in the region, something that could be called illiberal realignment has been occurring. And Duterte clearly looked to China, not just for infrastructural projects and other uh, foreign investment and so on, but also you know, for somebody who wouldn't criticize his human rights record, unlike Obama, who was called a whatever because of his, he, he, his government dared to criticize the drug war. Uh, and so that illiberal realignment has been attractive to a lot of non-democratic leaders in the region. Uh, but of course, that's balanced in turn by some security concerns. That, both Thailand, the Philippines, and other Southeast Asian countries are faced with the rise of China in the region. So the bottom line is it's very complicated, but I don't see a very uh, strong Western position. And you know, to just include, look at Myanmar. I mean, if, if there's any country in Southeast Asia where the West should be concerned, or champions of human rights should be concerned, it's Myanmar. And yet I see very limited involvement even you know, there. So uh, I don't think. I think these, both cases are largely internally driven uh, democracy uh, cases at the moment. Democracy autocracy cases. Thank you. Any uh, further questions? Uh, do we have questions? Okay. I myself have uh, questions for you, Mark. Uh, and it go directly to one of the main points that, that you made. Uh, in comparison between uh, Thailand and the Philippines, right? You show that opposition in uh, the Philippines in the moment, uh, uh, since the Duterte time, is quite weak, right? And, and you, you uh, so the calling out autocratization in the Philippines is uh, is weaker mm -hmm. uh, in in comparing to Thailand. I would like to hear. Uh, more from you. Uh, can you elaborate more? What is the, the root cause of this weakness uh, of uh, the opposition force in the Philippines uh, in the current era? Because in the past, we you show that we have similarities, right? You have people power, 1986, that huge you know, crowd coming out uh, similar to 1973 uprising in Thailand and 1992. But currently, uh, why under the, the Duterte, uh, up until now, the opposition force in, in the Philippines uh, cannot mobilize? Uh, yeah, thanks, Richard. That is the question I've been trying to answer, but uh, my it, it, it is, and this is where the comparison uh, gets tricky, but basically I've tried to boil it down to two major factors which I've uh, been using a distinction to try to convey. The one is, on, if you look at the side of the autocratizing regime, you see the Duterte and now the Marcos government relying on what I've called a uh, plebiscitory disguise. And this is a very effective way to claim we're still a democracy. Mm -hmm. After all, the Duterte is elected, his allies are easily elected in 2019, and Marcos Jr. is overwhelmingly elected in 2022. How can you argue with that? Uh, the issue of human rights is downplayed, which, you know, those taking a pluralist, uh, liberal democratic view would say that's inappropriate. Human rights are at the core of any understanding of liberal democracy. So at best, these are illiberal democracies, uh, or Philippines is an illiberal democracy, highly illiberal uh, under Duterte with this bloody drug war. Uh, 
Um, but it's a very effective disguise, and uh, it's proved very difficult to uh, push back against. And it's not just the elections, it's also the opinion polls, and it's the social media. Uh, and uh, it's been very interesting in my research. I've talked to a number of oppositionists who, you know, even if you dare to speak out, you will face, I'm not on social media, so I don't have to worry about this, but uh, you will face a number of you know, attacks, and particularly academics who are not used to uh, facing such ferocious uh, pushback when they say something are reluctant. Uh, uh, newspapers also face uh, cyber libel charges have been uh, more reluctant, and uh, as I said, it's harder to mobilize uh, protests in, in the Philippine case. So that's the one hand, that's the, you know, the, the, the there's not a strong political uh, demand um, for uh, opposition given this effective publicitary disguise. On the other hand, uh, there's not much a supply of opposition for two factors I mentioned, uh, although I need to think more about this. The one is the lack of resilient parties, and the other is the lack of new social movements to fill this vacuum created by the uh, discrediting co-optation and general weakness of old, older forms of civil society organization. So to take those uh, aspects in turn, uh, party resilience, this goes a little bit back to the Banyai question, parties in the Philippines are in fact not just heavily dynastic, in some ways they're only dynastic. Mm -hmm. I mean there's just not much beyond these uh, political dynasties. The Liberal Party, which was the party that supported uh, Duterte's predecessor, Noino Aquino, so that's yet another dynast, uh, but, but Noino Aquino, despite being uh, the, the son of Corey and the assassinated opposition leader, Nino Aquino, claimed he wanted to create a more programmatic party committed to political reform, anti-corruption measures. In fact, his campaign slogan was, if there's no corruption, there'll be no problem. Very attractive slogan in a highly impoverished country like the Philippines, with a lot of corruption. Uh, and so that was his slogan, and, and I talked to a lot of liberal party people in this period, and they were convinced that they were creating a new organization. When Duterte comes to power, all but a handful of these leaders defect to Duterte's side, even though there's this clear ideological divide, uh, and Noino Aquino had warned about the anti-liberalism of Duterte, uh, and yet they, they basically went over. So you know, political families will ally with those who offer them the, you know, the best spoils of office, and that continued under Duterte. So there was very little that could keep parties resilient. Uh, there was a left party uh, called Akbayan. They also uh, have fallen into virtual political insignificance because they can't win votes. They haven't uh, been able to mobilize programmatically. That could possibly be the equivalent of future forward, but if they are, then they're, they're, they're very weak. They virtually disappear. Uh, if you look about social movements, I've been, I, I need to think more about this, but the, uh, it is striking that Initial civil societal pushback in the Philippines was by these older groups. The Catholic, old by older I mean groups that have been active in the past. So the Catholic Church was very involved in this uh, people power uprising against Marcos. It was involved in this second uprising against Estrada, which was much more prob problematic because it was freely and fairly elected. Uh, and they resumed their protests under Duterte, but that by that time, uh, it turns out uh, they're much weaker. There are other uh, civil society groups that also uh, were weaker or some were co-opted, some were actually quite supportive of Duterte. There's an interesting research uh, uh, paper about this, talking about how organizations couldn't mobilize simply because many of their members supported the, the Duterte administration. So in that vacuum, you needed a new kind of social movement. It didn't happen. Look at the case of Thailand with the uh, youth protests of 2021. That emerges in a context where civil society had also been repressed and Decline, been demobilized, the traditional forms, and yet this new social uh, movement emerges. Why exactly that is, I leave to those who know more about Thai politics than I am. I just want to point out in this case that that's, that's quite an evident uh, contrast. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be interesting uh, point to investigate further, right? Uh, and uh, I would like to, to follow up on, on this. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, okay, both similarities and the difference, right? And, and from what you said, 
it seems like a paradox, right? That the produce regime, which is uh, less legitimate, because you know it's just a junta le leaders who you know manipulate the electoral process and undermine check and balance, you know, suppress civil society uh, since after the coup. So it creates a stronger pushback when you are more, you know, uh, undemocratic, when you, you know, cannot disguise yourself compared to the flipping case that when you see, when you confront with this kind of elected, you know, uh, strong man, it's more difficult uh, to, to oppose, right? Mm -hmm. But looking in the future, uh, do you see any prospect of, you know, uh, a new civil society emerge in, in the Philippines? Because I remember I, I read some of your articles, you talk about the cycle between populism and anti-populism in the uh, Philippines, right? Even though it's quite weak now at the moment, the liberal force, but could it, you know, come back after, you know, two presidents, you know, uh, Duterte and Marcos Jr., Jr. People can be quite upset, right, for, you know, over a decade under this kind of, you know, uh, strong man. Yeah, I, I may, maybe slightly facetious first take on that question, which is, and, and predicting uh, the future is obviously beyond us uh, uh, all, but trying to, you know, look at current trends and, and project them into the future. Um, and, and so my facetious statement as well, I said in answer to an earlier question, democracies haven't performed particularly well, but fortunately for democracy, dictatorships haven't either. Mm -hmm. So it's the failings of, of, of uh, various authoritarian regimes in Thailand, the Philippines, but beyond that, right? in, in, around the region and beyond Southeast Asia as well. Uh, and the catastrophic mistakes that authoritarian leaders can make. Uh, I mean, you know, political scientists spend a lot of time talking about information loops and dictators don't get enough information and you're thinking, well, you know, dictators might be cleverer than we think and then somebody invades Ukraine and finds themselves totally isolated on the world stage, uh, at least uh, uh, in terms of the European context. And you think, well, maybe dictators do make uh, uh, mistakes. So that, that would be my first take. Um, but the second one would be, would be that, so if you, if you look at the Philippine case with this uh, plebiscitary strongman rule, uh, Marcos Sr. was different because Marcos Sr. was, he did do the self-imposed coup, right, the martial law, and it was, it was a much more elaborate structure. First of all, as I said, when you do this kind of autocratization, it's a bigger deal because everybody sees it. Uh -huh. The democratic structures have been destroyed overnight. So you have to come up with a new constitution, and sure enough, Marcos had a fake referendum, should be familiar to the Thai audience. Uh, he then had to hold elections. The first elections are heavily manipulated. Again, uh, familiar, he came up with elaborate justification in terms of this Philippine-style Tatana democracy and so on. So it's, 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 a, it's actually a more ambitious project. And the other point I would make is that it puts more pressure on you to perform. Because you're breaking with the past by saying the past, you know, the democratic system is broken, we've got to fix it, we've got to restore stability, we've got to restore growth, we've got to bring back good governance. But if you don't, <laughs> if you create economic crisis, political instability, and so on, that tends to undermine your credibility. Right? So this does point to the fact that this plebiscitary strategy has its advantages because you're not, you're saying, really, we haven't really changed anything. The institutions are still there, we've been winning elections, okay. Human rights violations are a bit more than before, but show me the laws and this and that, particularly when the courts aren't enforcing them. Um, final point then is the Philippines doesn't deep suggest, the Philippine history doesn't suggest that these, this plebiscary rule can't hold on forever. If nothing else, and this is a little bit related to what I said earlier, because it's difficult in the Philippine context to keep 
the political families, the Banyai in the Philippine context, happy over the long term uh, if they're all in the same tent. That's a lot of big families in a tent that's not quite big enough. So one of the dynamics of Philippine politics, and you saw this against Marcos Sr., is increasingly some people feel like they're not getting quite enough of the political pie. And they will gradually start moving into opposed camps, not on principled grounds, but simply because they think they might do better if they uh, have more say in the next government. So that's why in the Philippine context, midterm elections in 25 and the next presidential elections in 28 could lead to a, pre a, a president or a new legislature or both who, who are more committed to liberal principles. And let me make a non principled democratic argument for that, which is if you are interested in having your fair share of the spoils, it's important to know the other side isn't monopolizing them. So the advantage of democracy, even if you take a very instrumental view, is you get a chance in the next election to get your you know, bigger share of the, the, the political pot. Uh, and so there is a kind of electoral logic to the Philippine politics that could uh, in, in turn encourage a, a greater adherence to, to liberal democratic values. Um, although that is a, a projection of the future and, uh, but, but we have seen that in the past that you get li li leaders who also for instrumental regions, uh, reasons take a more uh, uh, open approach to the political system. Thank you, Matt. Fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good answer. Uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, do, do you have anything that you would like to say uh, that you think you haven't said it yet? Uh, we can finish up earlier than uh, the schedule. Uh, feel, feel free to, well, maybe, yeah. maybe the one thing I'll say is, I mean, just thinking about Thailand in the 23 elections, so uh, I Maybe I could ask you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm not asking so much a political prediction question of how many votes will a particular party get. But, you know, people are, on the one hand, as I was arguing, voting against an unpopular government. Mm -hmm. But they've got a couple of different options. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly, they have the option between the dominant political party in the last 20 years, Puyatai, and this upstart party that stresses more political reform, uh, principled support of democracy, and so on, move forward. Uh, and so the, the, you know, the, the, the different opposition messages. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned earlier, the other thing that's interesting that I didn't mention in my talk, which we're mentioning here, is political scientists like to point to coalitional politics in the opposition. Mm -hmm. And what we don't see in the Thai case, as far as I can tell, is any strategizing between the major political up opposition forces saying, okay, so we don't compete with each other and let in, you know, pro-military parties, we will, you know, make some sort of arrangement so where you're stronger, you, you guys are the best, have the best chance of winning where we're strong. You don't see that kind of political deal like in Kuya Thai and move forward are, are clearly also competing against each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my question is, how do you think that would impact this, this further complication impact the, the 23 elections, May 23 elections. Mm. Yeah, that's like <laughs> very difficult question to, to answer, but yeah, you, uh, yeah, it's like you ask a question that is the core of this uh, political dynamics and the debate at, at the moment among opposition parties, right? Uh, because when Malaysian opposition parties join forces together, right, uh, and successfully, you know, defeat the the UMNO. They they work together and they come up with a strategy, right? When they they say strategic vote, they mean working together in some district that okay, Mahathir party is more you know uh, dominant. Uh, has more possibility to win other opposition parties don't feel their candidate, right? 
that the strategic vote among all opposition parties. But now in Thailand, uh, strategic vote uh, is being used in different uh, manner. Pure uh, Thai call for strategic vote. They ask all the, the voters who want to see change to, to eliminate prejudice to vote for Pure Thai only to win landslide as a uh, one party. Uh, but Pure Thai didn't mean a strategic vote in the sense of opposition parties working together and see which district you are stronger, you feel your candidate, I feel my candidate in my stronghold. So it leads to internal fight <laughs> very fiercely. Uh, between Pure uh, Thai and uh, Move Forward Party in this election. Uh, I think that's quite unfortunate because if you look at the polling survey and the election result from the uh, 2019 elections, clearly majority is on the opposition side and if they have common strategy and work together they can be landslide for opposition party. When I mean landslide, I mean for both of them, not yeah, for only any party. Yeah. And that can, you know, you you can push pro progressive agenda, you know, together and change Thailand into a more stable democratic path, right? Uh, if you work together by now competing with each other and no common strategy. I I afraid that you know it will open up some space for all the ruling coalitions for the conservative force you know to exert their you know their influence. Exploiting this, you know, uh, internal conflict within the, the opposition. Yeah. But we, yeah, we luckily the ruling coalitions are quite weak. So the damages of lacking common strategy and cooperation between opposition parties uh, in this election may be not that huge because uh, Parang Prasharat Party and uh, uh, Rome Thai Sanchat Party of Prayu, both of them are very weak in any way. So uh, easily to be defeated. Yeah. But I think we have to look beyond the election. Right, it's not only winning election, but what you are going to do uh, after the election. Yeah, what agenda that you want to push forward? For example, to uh, drafting a new constitution is needed, right? Uh, Thailand need to 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 have a new constitution, you know. Uh, but to write a new constitution, to have a new constitution, you have to work together and you have to have a common, you know, vision. What kind of democratic system that, you know, you want to have. I am afraid that just, you know, technical or uh, an issue on electoral system reform, I think Pure Thai and Gao Gai will have different opinions. Let alone a more challenging issue uh, sensitive issue like a reform of the army, reform of the monarchy. I'm afraid that you will see the real conflict between Pure Thai and Gao Klai after the election. So I managed to turn the tables and get <laughs> to give a little talk as well. That's very interesting. Anyone want to add? Mm -hmm. This will turn into an article, right? Do you have? That's that's the plan. Mm -hmm.
Okay. So you optimistic about Thailand more than the uh, the Philippines? Well, it's, it's as you say, it's all comparative, and I thought the Malaysian comparison is also very instructive. Mm. Uh, although Malaysia struggled in the last few years as well, this process is never easy, of course, um, and it's never finished. Uh, people who thought the U.S. was a stable democracy think again. Mm. <laughs> so uh, these processes are always always ongoing, and autocratization or push back against it are, 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 are almost always seemingly relevant issues. So, but just one last question. Uh, but what you, or we cannot see in advance is uh, the trigger, right? What would be the triggering event? How, how, how that important in the whole argument of your comparison? So, we have underlying structure, we have institutional rules, we have, you know, the history of uh, culture of opposition and, you know, other issues that you mentioned. But the trigger that, you know, very difficult to, you know, to see in advance. Absolutely, that's, that's a very good question, it's something I've thought a lot about. Uh, in hindsight, it seems obvious, Killing of an assassin, uh, opposition leader in 1983 is going to be a big trigger. Um, but you would have also thought the killing of a young man, 17 years old, who was caught on the camera being escorted by police later executed, uh, didn't have any no evidence that he was involved in drugs, and even if he had been, was arbitrary execution was certainly not the way to go about things. That did create some outrage, but it wasn't sustained. And so it didn't prove in the end to be a triggering event. So that's one of the things I've been thinking about, is you, you really can't predict, even events that seem highly emotional, killing of a young man, uh, good in school and all this kind of thing, uh, just wasn't enough to turn the tide against this drug war and the Duterte administration. Um, that said, I think that, you know, besides these highly emotional incidents of killings, which, which are all obviously uh, possible triggers. The too obvious manipulation of institutions is also, uh, you know, particularly stolen elections. I've done research on this, mm -hmm. and stolen elections have set off uh, uprisings across the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was against Marcos in 1986. Remember, there was a stolen election that preceded people power by a couple of weeks. Uh, Milosevic was overthrown after a stolen election mm -hmm. in uh, Serbia. Um, you know, there's just many cases you can point to where electoral manipulation leads to uh, a great deal of outrage, particularly if the opposition does a good job at proving beyond a reasonable doubt to people that they are a uh, imagined community of robbed voters, to use that uh, imagined community phrase in a different context. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're right, and it, it really is also dependent on the context. Uh, if a regime is already fragile, then these emotional events can really be the final straw. Uh, but if a regime is overall quite strong, it can withstand even something as outrageous as the killing of a young man uh, who's innocent of involvement in the drug trade. Right? So you, you have to look at the context, and it is difficult to predict, and the oppositions have to, you know, in a sense, be ready when these somewhat unpredictable triggering events occur. With resilient parties and you know social movements that are capable of acting. Yeah, like uh, spanning of uh, future forward party will lead to nothing if you don't already have strong support for the party, right? So, but uh, the message to the Thai elite then is, don't steal this election, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like the lesson that. <laughs> should learn from, you know, uh, Thai history itself and all over the world, right? Well, and I actually think that's a pretty, uh, I mean, I, as I said, I worked on it myself, wrote, wrote a few articles about that. So elections have been triggers, definitely, in many cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, another point that would be interesting to, to write an article about is after the fall of the autocrat. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where they go, right? Uh, yeah. And as was talked about earlier, whether they come back. 
Mm. We've seen the paternal autocrats being uh, on the shoot front. So. Yeah. Yeah. Also in 1976 in Thailand, remember that was important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one good thing about Thai uh, military is that they it's very rare to have a, a political families uh, led by the general, military general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think that's about time uh, to. Oh, you have one last question. Okay. Uh, okay. One last question, and then we are going to uh, end this seminar. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. What I should ask or not? Because I think this is a free country to ask, but. Just in my head, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, all of party talk about how South Korea turned to democracy, but not in the past. Uh, talk the real situation in South Korea. South Korea has prosecuted a uh, formal. President uh, Rotaru and Chun Doo Hwan to uh, coup and massacre in Guangzhou. But I would like to ask: Is can be real to prosecute who can a uh, military who coup in 2014 uh, and use violence in like two of past year? Yes. Can we, can we, uh, party should debate about uh, how we prosecute a military dictator who could and get them to the jail like Korea do? Can, can you believe it? Okay, thank you. Uh, South Korea. Uh, it, it's interesting you mentioned South Korea because that's been uh, discussed in the U.S. as well recently, uh, as this is the first time a former U.S. president has been indicted, albeit for different cause than South Korean presidents usually get indicted, corruption or uh, uh, human rights violations in this case, and payment uh, uh, for an illicit affair to keep his campaign from embarrassment. Um, so yeah, that the South Korean case is very interesting, and they have, I mean, it's kind of an occupational hazard. There's another South Korean president who was under investigation who committed suicide after he left office. It's uh, the fate of former South Korean presidents has not been fantastic. <laughs> there have been a lot of problems they've had, or some have survived, uh, have not been prosecuted, but their sons have faced uh, prosecution and so on. So it's a very interesting case. Um, but also you're dealing with this literature which is called transitional justice. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about how important that is. South African cases often discuss where they will bring out the crimes of the past, but you get immunity if you admit to the crimes. Uh, in the Philippines, there's been a lot of hand wringing about the comeback of Marcos Jr., or based on this authoritarian nostalgia due to the lack of strong transitional justice. Marcos, of course, went in, Marcos Sr. went to exile, as you mentioned, to Hawaii. Um, but then his, uh, his, his wife, Imelda Marcos, came back, his widow then, uh, and she was allowed to re-enter the country, even though she was under investigation, went, ran for office, won office. Uh, and so that is considered by many in the Philippines to be an example of failed uh, tr tr transitional justice. The problem with transitional justice is it creates and aggravates uh, political polarization and also potentially dangerous to a, 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 a new democracy which is why transitional justice doesn't always happen. Or, another interesting case is when it happens, like in Chile, it only happens after dem democracy's been fully consolidated. Because it's a very delicate issue in the early years, particularly if the institution being challenged is still powerful. But once a democracy becomes more consolidated than in a place like Chile, uh, such investigations have been done and it's, arguably been good for Chilean society to, to deal with those past issues. Um, and or another example in the region is uh, Indonesia. There have been some discussion of what to do about 1965 massacres. 
There was some effort to discuss that, but the pushback was too strong. And uh, the, under the current uh, government, there's clearly no interest in really in investigating that. So it's, it's, it's a tricky issue, and you know, there are always those who say we can't you know, just sweep this under the carpet, but there are others who say if we don't watch out, there could be danger. So it's, it's always a, a, a major dilemma, uh, but societies that have done so, particularly after democracy has been deeply consolidated, you could say, uh, the impact on societies is often seen as quite positive because these, these political wounds, as you call them, can, can finally heal if, if they're open, opened up and, and, and discussed. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big dilemma, yes. And, but I believe it will be uh, quite a heat issue after this election. Uh, if we have the, the transfer of power and the change of the, the regime. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Mark Thompson, and I would like you know you to give a round of applause to our speaker, you know, today. Yes. And yes, uh, hope we have a chance to welcome you back again and give another talk, you know. And you know, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, who are watching online and hope you learn a lot you know, from uh, today's discussion and hope to see you in future seminars. Thank you.